very much. Um, what I'd like to talk today about is um, a project we did a few years ago now, um, but it kind of it's a really good opportunity to pause and reflect. And the fact that um, you've been kind enough to organise this session, it seems to fit. fit. I hope um, you'll feel so perfectly within that. Um, I'm going to talk about a Google Earth-based application called Seeing Beneath Stonehenge. And I'd just like to say that I'm delighted one of my co-authors today, Lawrence Shaw, is in the audience, and he was uh, responsible for actually uh, creating uh, a lot of the actual application. Um, so we can both answer questions questions on that. What I'm going to do um, is talk a bit about the archaeology behind the application, uh, why we decided to make then the application based on the archaeology we'd found. Um, but I'm going to spend most of the, uh, the talk really talking about the um, the engagement and the questionnaire that we did and when we looked at actually how people engage with this application, what it meant to them, what they got out of it, problems, challenges, etc. Um, and really then take a, an opportunity to look back and think where we are now and actually whether, given the opportunity, whether we do the same again using Google Earth and whether actually it still has a lot of potential for us as archaeologists or whether other things have overtaken it. So I'll start by talking about the archaeology. Now, um, quite a number of years ago now, uh, I was uh, part of a, a project that many of you may have heard of called uh, the Stonehenge Riverside Project. And this was an enormous project based at Stonehenge. So for anyone who uh, doesn't know where this is, this is in uh, the bottom of uh, England in the south in the county of Wiltshire. It's a very famous uh, stone monument um, and it sits within, it's part of a World Heritage Site, it sits within quite a large area which has many, many prehistoric <coughs> monuments within it, dating from anywhere from the Mesolithic going onwards. Um, we were interested in the Neolithic, which is why we were there looking at this monument uh, and what had gone on around it. Um, so we weren't just looking at the stones themselves, we were looking at an area of up to a couple of kilometres away from it. And to give you an idea of the scale of this project, it ran for six years and we excavated over 60 trenches. Um, uh, we also looked at 17 different monuments and at the peak of its time uh, there were anything up to 200 archaeologists on, on the sites across the landscape at once. So it was enormous. We collected huge quantities of data um, and we found brand new monuments uh, such as new stone circles, uh, blue stone henge and we also found um, a whole new Neolithic village at Durrington Walls. And the pictures you can see behind me are obviously of the stones themselves, but also the reconstructions of some of the um, Neolithic houses that we excavated. And the results fundamentally changed our interpretation of this monument and uh, the new visitor centre, which you can see up there, I think on your top right um, behind me. Um, so it was very successful and it was great to be part of it. And as you can imagine, anything with the word Stonehenge in the UK uh, attracts enormous amounts of uh, media attention for good or for ill, for those who say the, uh, the latter. Um, and it was fantastic. We had a lot of press coverage, but we also clearly captured the imagination of many of the public. We had over 20,000 visitors over the course of our project just coming to see the excavations um, and wanted to get engaged. Lots of volunteer um, engagement, schools engagement, all sorts of uh, things like that. Um, we had international press, you know, various um, TV programs ad infinitum. I suspect everyone was bored senseless by the end of it. But the, the public appetite for this was fairly in, insatiable, um, which was a delight. But in 2009, when we stopped digging, so that's quite a long time ago now, um, Obviously, the opportunity for the public to come and see those excavations in the field and a lot of the media um, attention around it, obviously, by its very nature, started to fade. We had a huge backlog of material because certainly when we started the project, we had no idea it was going to get so big and we had no idea we were going to find so much stuff. So um, as with any um, excavation, um, there's so much post ex that needs to happen before you can get then the final information out. So there was going to be a kind of hiatus between us actually stopping doing the excavation 
um, and then actually producing final publications. Indeed, some of those final publications will be coming out within the next 12 months. So if you think that's quite a long gap, four or five years. So we wanted to think about a way that we could kind of keep on engaging with the public and get some of our interim findings out there prior to the kind of traditional monographs and then the, uh, the public book that will go with it. And it was at this point we got talking to someone from Google and they suggested to us that we consider applying for Google Factual Research Award. And they said, it's something you might want to think about is that we're supporting work to put layers on Google Earth. Um, we don't have many archaeology ones at the moment. We think it would be an interesting idea. Um, so we went ahead with that and we were delighted to be awarded a small amount of, of money. Um, and we had at the time about 100 gigabytes of data, um, everything from traditional archaeological maps and plans, geophysical data, lots of uh, aerial photography, also um, other things like 360 recording as well. But it was in, um, in, in essence quite a traditional excavation for, for the UK. Um, so a sort of a fairly traditional suite of, of data sets. And what I'm not going to talk about today is the technical side of how we put this together. Um, but those of you who want to know more about that, Lawrence and I would be very happy to, to talk about it at, at the end um, or later to, today or tomorrow. Um, essentially, what we created was we took a kind of the best bits of our data and we created a number of layers that people could download for free and explore the Stonehenge landscape and all of our work um, through Google Earth. And so um, what you'll see if you download uh, the layer for yourself, the KMZ file, is you can go and visit everywhere we've dug, so the 60 trenches, uh, all geolocated. You can look at all of our trenches. So, for example, you can see what we found in each trench, a little synopsis of what we had there. Um, you can take a landscape tour if you're not familiar with the Stonehenge landscape and learn a bit about the archaeology and how the chronology of things work together. Um, and you can do that either by audio or by subtitle. Um, but really, it's a kind of self um, guided and self-integrated tour. So you can, you can do what you want. There isn't a, a specific route way through it. Um, you can turn various layers on and off. So if you're interested in the trenches, great. But if you want to see our geophysics, you can have a look at that and you can go to the different places in the landscape. If you want to see some 360 photos of various points in the landscape or including some of the ones we dug, um, you can have a look at that. And the one up there is where we were excavating this new um, blue stone henge. We also did a small number of reconstructions just to give people some ideas of some of the monuments um, and uh, the one on the top right is uh, the southern circle and it looks that grey line beneath it is actually the modern road um, so you can kind of see how they're really situated within the landscape and the one over on this side is uh, one of the Neolithic houses, which you can actually go in and have a look, look around. And if you want to, you can turn on the, the maps and plans, and we've digitised a bit of some of the trenches, so you can see how the reconstruction sits over the actual archaeology that will be found. So it's, it's quite varied. There's a few videos in there as well. So we tried to put a mixed kind of media to, together. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what the actual application is like. But... Really what I want to concentrate on today is actually how people engage with it um, and what they did with it and what their feedback to us was. So we launched it uh, quite a while ago now in uh, the autumn of 2011 um, and we used an awful lot of social media to promote it. Again, because it was Stonehenge, we were lucky enough also to get some press associated with it, which helped. And we saw, as would be expected, an immediate spike. We had 8,000 downloads within the first couple of months. Um, but of course, inevitably, they start plateauing away once you start uh, stopping on the social media, you're not so active. So um, we saw that kind of curve going immediate peak use, then down. But I should say, even up to today, there's been 80,000 downloads of the application um, from the bespoke website that it sits within. And if you work that out, that's um, about 2,000 a month. Um, although the peak is at 
at the beginning. Um, so it's quite quite surprising, I, th I think, to us how many people did engage with it. But then again, you've got to remember there are, uh, was it one million uh, users of uh, Google Earth? I think it's had one million downloads. Um, so there's a huge numbers um, around the world. Um, things like our um, Facebook and uh, the YouTube video. Uh, Lawrence created a, a YouTube video to encourage people to engage with that. That had 23,000 hits on it. So there were some social media things that worked very, very well to driving engagement uh, with it. And most people uh, were engaging via a desktop. Um, and uh, many uh, were actually new users to Google Earth, which was interesting in, it, in itself. They weren't all your digital natives, um, which I think is something that surprised us. Um, and the range was over about over 100 countries, different countries uh, downloaded it, although the site is, uh, I should say, and all the, the text was just in, in English only. But we ran a questionnaire uh, to look at actually what people were getting from the experience. And in particular, what we were interested in was... A, we wanted feedback on how if we were to do something like this, again, we might re-kind re of um, consider it. But particularly, I think, for me, I was interested in how the effects of engaging with a digital application influenced people's engagement with the actual physical archaeology and whether they were more likely to go and visit it and actually find out more about the site. And so we had over 150 um, responses to the questionnaire, and we had an incredibly positive um, reaction to the application. Um, and people just said they absolutely uh, loved it. There were very, very few who really said, you know, this, this isn't, isn't for me. It was literally in the one or two um, uh, responses. And that was mainly actually to do with the problem with they just didn't get on with technology. So they found using um, Google Earth as an application not something that really worked for them. Um, most of our respondents, 70% um, were from uh, the UK, 5% uh, from uh, the rest of the um, EU, and then there was um, another 15% uh, from a whole range of countries, um, North America, but all, all over the world, as far as Yemen, um, um, China, Japan, all over the place. But the key thing from this was over 80% of people, uh, when you analyse the data, said that using the application would make them more likely to visit the monument. So there were a subset of people who were already interested in archaeology, and I can break down this, this more uh, in questions if you, if you like, who said they were... The, you know, they were clearly interested in archaeology, and that's why they come to the application. But there were a good percentage of those that that didn't know much about Stonehenge, but just had heard a bit about it, so they thought, you know, they'd have a go. And actually, they hadn't necessarily been there, but after using the application, they said they would. They'd be far more likely to actually go and visit the site. And to me, that was um, really quite, I don't know, surprising. I, I think I thought that maybe people would look at it because they were already interested in Stonehenge, but it was certainly acting as, as a driver. Um, we also looked at the profile of users um, by the questionnaire, and we were... I should say that um, when we started this project, you know, we, we were given this opportunity by Google, but I think it's uh, fair to say uh, that we didn't actually think much beyond actually we're making something for the general public, which of course is a very broad suite of people. And in hindsight, it would be much better to think about actually which audiences we were targeting. Um, but what we found was a significant proportion of the questionnaire responses were um, people who were interested in uh, education. Um, and a lot of people teaching A-level archaeology in the UK had found it uh, and had wanted to use it. Um, now, whether educators were more likely to answer our questionnaire because it was an educational project is a, uh, an interesting question in itself. Um, but we also found that um, there were a number of commercial archaeologists, um, too, who commented. And you can see one example of this uh, here. Um, and so we had... Um, we had about 20% of the responses were from um, commercial professional um, archaeologists, i.e. non-academic. Non um, 
but huge amounts. So I think we have 52%, you know, half of the respondents, um, they identified themselves as having a general interest in archaeology. So it's possible that that questionnaire is being dominated by those who already view themselves as, as pretty interested. It's not surprising. But I think that, that focus on the educational side for us was a very interesting thing. And we hadn't, as I say, we hadn't really gone in with that as a, a viewpoint of what we should do. But looking back, be something to consider. Challenges. There were inevitably challenges. Um, we had a couple of people here. Um, they just couldn't get the, the thing to work. There were a number of people who struggled to, uh, to download onto their computers. And really, this was based, as I said before, on issues with understanding uh, technology. To try and counteract this, we embedded tutorials and links to the Google Earth tutorials. And clearly, a lot of people found those helpful if they were new to um, the subject um, and really getting uh, you know, engaged with Google Earth. And unsurprisingly, um, those with mobile technology uh, really just like, I, I just want to be able to use this on my, on my iPad and I can't. Um, but being new to Google Earth, as I said before, didn't seem to inhibit people in their engagement uh, with the tool. So just to kind of um, you know, move on to discussion now, I think this is what we found. But looking back now and thinking about if we were doing this again, um, when, we, when we started doing Google Earth, um, the Sing Beneath Stonehenge, there weren't actually that many layers on Google Earth that were related to archaeology or heritage applications. And I would say that even though things have moved on a bit, it's still the case that I think Google Earth hasn't been used as, as much by archaeologists as um, potentially, I suppose, it, it could have been. And so it's interesting to think about why that is and actually whether there's uh, a world out there that maybe we should be engaging with or whether actually there are issues with Google Earth that means that we should be thinking about something else. And I don't really mean to come to a conclusion here. I just tried to sort of uh, highlight some of the issues we've been thinking about now, about how technology has moved on. And many things that have moved on. The first key one is that when we started putting this application together, you needed Google Earth Pro. You had to pay for it. Um, now, of course, you can do it on open access software, and the actual process of doing it is incredibly easy. Um, it took us a very long time before because we had to uh, create a whole load of uh, issues around creating the coordinate system from uh, RGIS to make it fit with uh, Google Earth and a whole variety of other um, issues associated with the GIS relationships. Um, that now has been largely um, removed. So we could do it much faster. That would be great. Um, another key point is time. Again, it took us a lot longer because of these issues, but it's still, I think it's fair to say, although you, it is much easier to do something like this, it does take someone, obviously, to sit down and physically do it. Um, and often, I think, because we hadn't gone into the project thinking we're going to do this at the end of it, we haven't planned it from the beginning. Um, and I think now, if I was trying to do something like this, obviously I would like to think I would do it at the start of a project so that I can embed it in. But actually, it's, um, although it might seem relatively simple, I'm sure we all know that you know, producing something like this is not the work of uh, but a mere um, a moment, as one of my colleagues famously uh, said. Um, but um, bigger question, is Google Earth still the right way to go? Uh, is it actually um, an untapped resource for us with so many um, people downloading it across the whole globe? Well, there are other solutions now. Um, we've got a variety of alternatives, some of which are up here. Um, ArcGIS Online, uh, which I know there's been some talks about um, during C CAA this year. Um, also, QGIS now has... Um, uh, a, a 2D um, visualization plugin, and also um, there's lots of ways you can stream uh, web data so you can actually connect through your GIS straight to the web. So it's much easier than when we started. Google Earth hasn't really embraced mobile technology um, in the way that we might hope it, um, it would have done when we started. Um, and you could also suggest that actually um, apps are possibly an interesting way to go, although I would, I, I would 
hesitate to say that they're at a point where they're so easy to make um, that you could do it in quite the same way. I think the resources required to produce something that was really good and then also to persuade people to physically download um, the app is tricky. If you're on Google Earth, at least you've already got that and everyone's got it um, free and downloaded. Um, Google Maps. Google Maps has obviously become much more widely used and has the very um, big advantage that you can go straight from a web browser that you're not actually having to open up something else. Um, and I think really, you know, it has started to um, be able to bring in multiple data streams. Um, you can now get 3D imagery in it, um, but we don't have the same suite of satellite images uh, within it as we did on um, Google Earth, and you um, can't yet, although I'm sure it will come, bes um, embed bespoke tools, and we found those uh, very, very useful um, within Google Earth. Other things to consider are data and data permanency. Um, it's interesting to, to reflect on these because actually about who, who owns the data and, and whether it should uh, be around forever, et cetera. Um, we, we, when we started doing Stonehenge Riverside Project, we always knew we were going to archive with the archaeological data service. So for us, the data was going to end up being archived in that forum already, so that was going to be okay. Um, obviously, the problems with Google Maps and Google itself about the ownership of data has put many people off engaging with those products, and that's something that's come in since we actually made the application. But I think moving beyond that, um, thinking about the lifetime of our project, essentially I, I would, I suppose, almost argue that our project is coming towards the end of its lifetime and that these things are only are going to be around for the limits within the current um, technology and also the current set of interpretations because what you have on Seen Beneath Stonehenge is a snapshot of our views at that time. Now, it's very informative and it contains a lot of data, but obviously it's going to be superseded by our interpretations and the write-up of the entire site. And it was never designed to be actively curated. So this is not something that we've been going into and updating, etc. Essentially, probably what we would do next is think about what should we replace it with wholesale rather than trying to go in and mess around with it. Now, I don't think that's wrong. It's had a fantastic lifespan. It's been going for uh, over five years, and it's had 80,000 downloads. So could you argue, then, that actually it's, it's done its time and it's done, it's done well? So just to um, conclude, really, I think it's worth considering uh, whether, as archaeologists, We've really engaged enough with Google Earth. Um, it's clear that the public have an insatiable appetite um, for digital media in which to engage with our material. Um, and I would suggest that um, when we're trying to navigate the oceans of data, which is the, the theme of the, the conference, uh, Google Earth does present one way of spatially relating very complex, both chronological and um, spatially uh, complex um, data sets in a way that's actually quite intuitive um, for um, a, a novice user to engage with. And I think um, possibly something for us that we've uh, really noticed is that even those people who have yet to really uh, fully embrace some of the technology as, as uh, compared to the, the specialists we have here at this conference, um, the next generation of digital natives are really, really um, technology expectant. And I think we, uh, we have yet to give, give them everything that they expect. Thank you very much.